Oh, no, you don't. Yeah, whatever. All right. Well, live there. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's podcast. We're talking about the financial cost of the weight. Right, we just got to look at the numbers here because a lot of times this is what hits people in the gut the hardest when you really reflect on how much it's costing you to be overweight. Right? I'm not even talking about the, the insurance medical bill side of it. Okay, we're going to leave that alone. I'm talking about the financial cost of eating enough food to be overweight. A lot of times we don't think about that. And I notice it a lot now because I see my kids, like, geez, a can of Pringles was $4.20. <laughs> That's a snack. Yeah, no one's eating a, you know, no one's spreading a, a can of Pringles out over, over a week, right? That, that's a snack for, for a lot of people, $4. So one thing that can really help motivate you a lot of times is to write down or at least become aware, what are you spending a day, a week to be overweight and use that as your motivation as well, because the cost of food is going through the roof, but I'll tell you what's not going through the roof cost wise is the cost of vegetables and fruits and natural foods. That stayed pretty consistent and static over this inflationary time. But I look at a lot of the junk food and the processed foods and it's going through the roof. So I want you to start thinking, how much is that costing me? Because I know a meme out there, this idea that, oh, eating organic is really expensive. Um, no, overeating processed foods is really expensive. Start looking at what you're spending at these fast food restaurants for the junk food, for the processed stuff. Really pay attention to it because I think you're blind to a lot of the costs of it. And once you start realizing how much money this is to be overweight, it starts to frame it another way. It becomes one more thing you use to motivate yourself. I got to get control of this. Good Lord, that's a lot of money. It is very easy, very easy to spend $10, $20 a day on extra junk food. Let's be honest, okay? And you're thinking, I know you are. To some degree, you're thinking about the cost from 10 years ago. <laughs> Jeez, I bought some candy recently. That stuff, it used to be, used to be 50 cents for a bag of M&Ms. You know, it's like almost $2 now. And sometimes it's more than $2, depending on where you're getting it from. So I want you to start looking at the cost and the price of what it's costing you to be overweight and start taking that into account because you may find that it's a lot of motivation to want to get a handle on this. I notice a lot of people that are overweight that are non-smokers say, geez, how does someone pay that for cigarettes? Well, how are you paying that for the food? It's costing you a lot of money to be overweight. And I think when you start to get a real clear idea on this, it might kind of inspire you to want to start eating healthier and put some more of that money back in your pocket. So I hope this helps you out. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. Here we are on a Friday, thank God. Starting a little bit later than normal, but that's okay. Let me get this out of the way. Oh, shit. Actually, let me move that there in case I say something. I like to record myself there in case I say something smart. I'll have it on video. <laughs> there we go. Mm. Yeah, so I'm starting a little late today, but I was doing a bunch of videos, and when inspiration hits, you got to take advantage of it. <laughs> What's up, Kelly? How's it going? Oh, Kelly says, I now think of what other groceries I can buy with the money instead of that one meal. Ah, that's brilliant. I will tell you, you know, again, the people that say eating organic, eating healthy costs more. I just want to strangle them. I mean, they're, they're on my shit list right after the people that say, I know what I need to do. I just need to get myself to do it. Um, no way. No way. You come look at what I'm spending on food a week. And uh, there's no way in hell. My lunches for the week are about 20, 25 bucks for the whole week. That's five days of lunches. Okay. My breakfast for the whole week that satisfies me is probably $10. So no, no, no. It's the muffins. It's the donuts. It's the coffee. It's the lattes. It's that's the stuff that starts adding up real fast. And when you start saying, yeah, what can I buy for that money? the fruits and vegetables and the healthy food, not only is it, even if it costs a little bit more, which it doesn't, um, even if it did, you're getting way more bang for your buck because there's a key word we need to understand here. It's called satiety, which is the satisfaction, the fulfillment you get from the food that you eat. And when you're eating these processed foods, you have got to understand that they are processed and engineered to make you hungry all the time. There's no satisfaction coming from these fast foods. 
And we just always, I don't know if that was, if anyone else knew this, but I was always say about Chinese food. Like, oh, you eat Chinese food and you're hungry an hour later. Yeah, well, it's like that with all these foods. Don't you wonder why you're always hungry? This is such a, this conversation I could have all day long. It, and again, it's kind of like where we're at with the food in America. It's like the story, you know, the, the old fish swims by the two young fish and uh, goes, hey, how's the water? And the young fish goes to the other one, the what? What's, how's the what? You know, it's like when we're surrounded by stuff, we start to just lose sight of it almost. And we're so surrounded by these foodstuffs that we've kind of lost sight of the fact that it's not real food. And the key problem with that is that you're eating all the time and you're like, I'm always hungry. Can't get, I can't get a handle on my, my cravings and my hunger. I don't know why. Is there something wrong with me? Do I need to go on Ozempic to manage my hunger? Well, let me see what you're eating. And again, I say this as a person, I did this. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to eat sugar and trash all day and be hungry all day. I used to call it the endless hunger, always hungry. Nothing satisfies me. Now I'm not like that. I'm not on a medicine. What changed? I eat different, <laughs> you know? And I say this, I, I can't say this one enough. You know, Zempic, what it does is it increases your GLP-1 hormone, which makes you feel more satiated and satisfied, slows down digestion of food. Guess what else makes more GLP-1 hormone? Natural foods, fibers at the top of the list, healthy proteins, healthy fats, because the GLP-1 hormone is made in your gut. So you need foods that stay in your gut longer so your, your gut can make the hormone. You know, I don't want to hear about that, Jim. I just want the medicine. Well, that's that's America for you, I guess. That may become in the world. So there's always the choice. But, you know, again, just to let you know, you're never going to hear this on Oprah's special. She didn't talk anything. She, I didn't hear the, the word fiber mentioned once. Didn't hear healthy diet mentioned once. I heard her talking about I can eat half a bagel now instead of a full bagel. So you don't hear this message very often, but, you know. We live in the, it's a war zone out there, folks. It's a war zone out there and you're being conditioned to, you know, let like, like lamb to the slaughter. I hate to say it, but it's just true. Um, yeah, for sure. Aaron says, yeah, the majority of people eating a sad diet, right? A standard American diet. If that's what you're eating and you're hungry all the time, it's not your genetics. It's not your hormones. It's not your menopause. It's your diet. It's what you're eating. Okay. And, uh, it ain't helping you. It ain't helping you financially. It's not helping you health wise and it's not helping your weight. Most likely. Carolyn says, yep, I'm shaking my head up and down <laughs> for sure. Right. I don't know. And the, the price of food, I, I, you know, it's just like, I'm not saying this is part of their big plan. I, I but it, it's, I, it does seem to me that the junk food, the fast food, it's almost like the cliche drug story, you know, where the drug dealer gives the person the first hit for free. You know, and I see a lot of that stuff. I see a lot of that stuff going on in the processed food world, the junk food world, the fast food world, that it was really cheap for a long time. Is it now? I haven't eaten fast food in forever. My kid, I'll let him eat at Burger King. Wants to eat a, a Impossible Whopper. Fine. But I get the, I pay for it. It's like $9. What? Is that cheap? Is that cheap? $9 for a burger that's, you know. Is that cheap now? Is that what we're considering cheap? Because that's half my budget for my salads all week long that satisfy, nourish me, make me feel good. So, you know, don't give me that shit. Don't, don't give me, don't come at me with that shit about how healthy food's more expensive. It'll, it'll hold me back because <laughs> it's bullshit. It's bullshit. And they're fleecing you now because now you're addicted to the food. Now you can't say no to it. Just like the cigarettes, right? You shook your head with the cigarettes. How, do, how the hell is anyone smoking? Spend $10 a pack of cigarettes. How the hell is anyone doing that as you go into the same fucking store and go and spend $10 on a bag of chips, a candy bar, and a soda? Right? You got to see it for what it is. And they don't even tax that, by the way, which they should. Everyone up in arms because out in New York, they want to tax soda. And all of a sudden, it's our, our freedoms and our liberties. It's a crazy world. It's a crazy world we're living in. It's crazy, but yeah, it's up to everyone to look at what they're spending their money on, I suppose, you know, <laughs> Don TGIF, right? How can every Friday feel so exciting? I, I love every Friday so much. I, I don't know. I just love it. What's up, Vicky? Not just America and the UK private doctors prescribe Ozempic with no clinical history. Wow. There we go. You know? And that's crazy to me because yeah, UK, it's like, it's socialized and in, in America, some people, you know, always think of like socialized stuff is, 
Well, I mean, even I will say one thing I always heard about the UK, and I don't know if this is still true or if ever it was really true. Someone from the UK told me it, but I didn't verify it. But they tell me before you could get prescribed antidepressants there, they you would have to like do some exercise program for a month or two, you know. And um, it's that type of thinking. I was like, wow, that that would be nice. But yeah, with the with the Ozempic, it seems like they're just folding right in with the Americans and how they do it, you know. But yeah, the Ozempic, man, just get ready. I, you know, I, the more I learn about Ozempic and I do this right from the get go, you, if you've been watching me, I've said this the whole time before I even really understood it. I just don't believe it. I don't believe there's any one thing you can do that just is going to fix your weight. I, I think you've got to approach it. Like, again, it's like, if I want to play guitar, I can't just learn chords. You know, if I really want to master the guitar, I can't just learn scales. You, you've got to learn all the different components of, of it. I want to play basketball. I can't just learn how to shoot. You got to learn how to dribble and to play defense pass and everything, anything you want to do in life and do well, you can't just learn one part of it. So Ozempic never, I never bought into it. And, um, the more I get to see it and I got people in my program that are on it. So I understand the psychological things, um, which are that a lot of those people are stressed out because they know it's not permanent. They know it's just a band aid. They don't feel that great. And, uh, you know, yeah, they're losing weight, but, but there's a lot of anxiety underneath it is what I've seen. And um, the more I learn about what it does, it's like, holy shit, wouldn't you like to at least attempt a, a natural long-term approach that's healthier and not where you're jabbing yourself in, in the side with this shit? But I don't know. At the same time, we just keep moving down the line where we just accept more and more medicines. And I'm not against medicines. I, I want you all to know that. Um, but I just think, you know, it just becomes a shortcut. I know some people feel so desperate and might need it. And again, I'm not talking about type two diabetics. I'm not talking about just the weight loss, but as you said, with no clinical history, it's Ozempic because doctors do what they do. Again, I, I love doctors, but I, I certainly would not go to a doctor to find out how to lose weight. They don't know anything about weight loss. Do you know that? They don't know anything about nutrition. They, they, they're not trained. They're not trained to make you the healthiest person you can be. They're trained to deal with acute medical issues and, and chronic ones and treat chronic ones with medicine. They don't get to the core of stuff. And let's just be, we all know this. And so when it comes to weight, you've never heard any, any helpful advice from your doctor about how to lose weight. Let's be honest. We, we've all been there where the doctor goes at best, you might want to think about losing weight. Yeah. You don't fucking think I already thought about that doctor. <laughs> you know, you're walking hundred pounds. You don't think I might've thought that. Thanks doc. Do you have anything else besides that for me? And they don't, they don't, they don't know anything about weight loss. They know very little about nutrition unless it is a personal interest of theirs. But as, as a systematic thing, doctors do not learn about weight loss. They don't learn about nutrition in any real way in medical school. I like my, my man, Dr. Allo, one of my favorite. I, I love this guy. He's one of my faves. Um, he's a cardiologist. He's on TikTok. <laughs> so I love that. But he says it himself. He's like, they don't teach doctors about nutrition. They don't know this shit unless they're just personally interested in it. So whatever though. But so yeah, they'll, they'll prescribe those. They don't know. They know as, they know as much about weight loss as you do. I love doctors. We all love doctors. They know a lot about the human body. They don't know a lot about weight loss. So it just is what it is. Uh, what's up, Kelly? My first goal was to drop 70 pounds. I have 14 to go. Holy moly. That is quite an accomplishment, Kelly. Very proud of you. Enjoy that. Okay. And, um, you know, again, the first goal, another cool way to look at that. I'm going to write this one down. I'm going to make a video of this because I think this is a cool concept in percentages is to not just think like okay well i've lost um 50 56 pounds which is cool but another way to kind of frame that is that i have i'm well, let's see 50 i'm just gonna ballpark it but but, but probably about 80 percent of the way to your goal yeah 80 percent exactly right 80 percent of the way to your goal that's another way to think about it or 80 percent of the way to my first goal Okay. And I like the percentage because it gives you context. A lot of times like, Oh, I've lost 50 pounds, lost 50 pounds. Cool. But when we say I'm 80% of the way to my first goal, it, it gives you context of where you started from, where you want to go and where you're at and what you've accomplished. So great job though. That, very, very impressive. That's quite a goal. Yeah. Carolyn says the lineup at McDonald's is shocking every day. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I, we all know this. We've all seen, we all drive by the fast food places and they're, they're packed to the gills. And again, I get it. I get it. You know, that's a whole other thing. You know, it's like, again, with, with the cigarettes, you say, how oh, the shit is someone paying $10 for a pack of cigarettes? It might be even more than that now. But, um, you know, these same people are waiting in line, <laughs> spending their money at these, these things. And, and it's for the same reason. 
You know, the same reason that someone's paying $10 for a pack of cigarettes is the same reason you're paying $10 for a bag of chips, a candy bar, and a soda. It's the same reason. You know what the reason is? What do you think? Because <laughs> you're both addicted. But anyways. Um, but hey, how do people get out of addictions? You know, they, they got to realize it. <laughs> Jody says, love the fired up gym. I was fired of coming in here. I don't know what's going on today. I was kind of a calm. I don't know. Life's so funny. I just, you know, some days you could start off and you're just like in a shitty mood. And then it's just like, then you feel better. It's just, it's funny how things change, you know, just even in a couple hours. I don't know. Today's been one of those days. Um, yeah, Kelly, that is an amazing job. Yeah. It's really, really, really good. <laughs> Uh, so he says up in arms about freedom to consume, but not public transportation. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could go down that path all day. I mean, the, the things we're upset about, what we're not upset about is, is always, that's a whole conversation every day. It's hard for me to say, no, I feel like I have a person that tells me what to do and I do it. Yeah. Cappuccino. Exactly. That person, that person, oh, thanks for the rose. That person that you feel is telling you what to do is your subconscious mind. It, it's your internal dialogue is an aspect of that. And program yourself then, which is my program. That's what it's all about. We all feel that, don't we? Right? There, there's all of us, all of us in our lives. There's something we want to do that we're not doing. There's things we want to stop doing that we keep doing. This is, to me, this is the, the cornerstone of, of challenge of being a human being. And no one ever explains to us how to deal with this. And I think you would never even have a chance of being able to deal with that until you understand the conscious subconscious mind. And so the subconscious mind is the part of your mind that runs your habitual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And you've internalized it as this inner voice in your head. And it, it tells you what to do. And uh, that's that's really what the program is all about, is, is what are you saying to yourself? What do you say to that voice? How do you deal with that voice? Um, how do you create a better, more supportive, encouraging voice that gets you the results you want? That That's that's what, what I deal with. That's what I do. And so I get what you're saying, Cappuccino. What I will say to you is, is please go to my bio, click the link, get the hypnosis session and watch the video I made for you because it'll give you a deeper understanding of exactly what you're talking about. Because right now you have a vague sense that someone's in control of me. You all feel that way, right? Because you think about weight loss fucking 24 hours a day, it's not happening. And so you feel like there's some part of you that's in control. You, you don't understand it. You don't understand it. You spend your whole life trying to. What's wrong with me? How can I keep doing this dumb shit? And you never come up with an answer. And I'm telling you this, the answer to that question is to start understanding how your mind works, that you have a conscious subconscious mind dynamic because your subconscious mind, the parts in control doesn't operate like your conscious mind does, which is to say your conscious mind is very logical and rational. You know, you want to lose weight. You know that you should do it, but your subconscious mind doesn't think that way and doesn't do that shit. Thanks, Don. Um, so, you know, it, it's about getting your subconscious mind on board. And, and that's what the video will show you. So go check that out. Because what you're experiencing is what pretty much everyone experiences. It's struggling. Um, Vic says on the NHS here, there are a lot of checks. Bus private doctors and online pharmacies are not regulated. Oh, oh, oh. Private doctors and online pharmacies are not regulated. Wow, that is very interesting. I never knew that. That's 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 pretty interesting to me. So if he says, if it's medically necessary for a person, fine, but I don't have PCOS or prediabetes. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. And I work with people, you know, even the term prediabetes is, um, you know, prediabetic isn't like a real term. You know, it, it was a phrase that was made up. It's not like a real medical condition, you know, but but it's a word that describes most of the public. Why though? Why are most people prediabetic? That's the, that's the more interesting question to me. It's because people are addicted to the you know, glucose spikes. You know, glucose spikes, you eat flour, sugar, those are two ways to spike your glucose real quick. And if you think about the natural world, you can't, you can't spike your glucose levels fast. <laughs> I'll take that a little hard. Um, you can't spike your glucose levels in nature, really, you know, short of running into a, a, a beehive and eating all the honey. It's very difficult to spike your glucose in nature. You go through your life rarely spiking your glucose. But now in the modern world, you're spiking your glucose four, five, six times a day. That's why there's so much diabetes. The diabetes numbers is absolutely, I, 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 I'm going to do this. I got some cool, I got a cool camera coming today. And um, one of the things it does, I'm going to test it. I don't know if this will help or not. Because I could just get a thing printed out. 
But anyways, I want to show you the, I want to start showing you the graphs. I'm going to show you these every day. I got some, some images I want to show you regularly because it's, I want to burn them into your brain. Cause once you start realizing this, you're going to realize that we're being duped just like the cigarette industry duped people into smoking for all those years. You're being duped into eating bullshit food. That's killing you literally killing us. And the diabetes is one example of that because the diabetes numbers are absolutely off the charts. And it's not, a, it's not a mystery. And the people's genetics didn't change in 40 years to give them diabetes. It's the bullshit they put in their body consistently. that's spiking their glucose, spiking their insulin, and, uh, you know, set them on the path of diabetes. Where it's almost like a rite of passage now. People just almost assume they're going to be type 2 diabetic. So, yeah, the way we think about this stuff is pretty interesting. I said, thanks everyone. I don't have much support at home. This is my happy place. Oh, okay, Kelly. Well, I'm really glad that this is a place for you. That's why I do this. I'm so happy to hear that because that's my goal is to make this. And I know I've been saying the spark thing. I promise you, I promise I'm making you this promise. So if I don't come back Monday, bust my chops about this. Okay. Monday or no, today I'm going to do it is um, the spark program. So this is a free membership site for anyone who wants it. And um, if you go to my bio and click the link, get on the session, get the session, you'll get on my email list and I will send you the information for it. But it's a free membership site where I have some trainings. I got a hypnosis session. Um, I got a mindset challenge. I got some cool stuff. It's all free. You can have it because again, my mission is to help as many people as possible live at their goal weight. And I know what it's like. I know a lot of people, the majority of people in my experience do not have the support systems they need, you know? So, um, it's very difficult. It's difficult if you don't have the support, you know, for two reasons. One is they're, they're, it, they're actively sabotaging you. And the, the bigger one though, is that you don't have any role models that show you how to think and how to behave like a thin and healthy person. And so I always use the example, like, like trying to become a thin, healthy person on your own is like trying to learn a language on your own or trying to learn the piano on your own. It's very challenging. Right. The, the idea that I'm going to put you in front of a piano, you're just going to figure out music is, is very unlikely, you know. Um, so that's why I do this for you get to hear me talk. I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, how to think like a thin, healthy person. You know, and I, I love doing it through the questions, you know, because the, the questions come in usually from a person in a diet or mindset, which is fine because 99 percent of people who want to lose weight have a diet mindset. And I take that diet mindset and I like to translate it into a thin, healthy mindset for you. You know, that's a little bit of what I'm trying to do here. And so it's like, I'm, I'm teaching you a new language, a thin and healthy language, and I'm trying to make you fluent in it so that when you go back out in the real world and you hear all the fucking stupid diet bullshit, all of a sudden you hear it and you say, wait a second, that's what I want for you. I want you to be able to hear it. You know, like in music's like this, you know, I, my, my wife's, I, I love my wife did this. I remember one time I started to learn music and I was like, listen to a solo. She goes, oh, geez, I thought that was one note. <laughs> you know, that's what it, and I know what she meant. It's like you, when you don't have a paradigm for what's going on, you have just this vague idea of it. And that's what's going on with weight loss for you. You have a very, very vague, very simplistic, superficial idea of how to lose weight, which is basically some strategy or tactic to cut your calories down, cut out carbs, intermittent fast. Weight Watchers, whatever your idea is, it's it's a way to lower your calories. But that's all you got. You don't have any idea how to shift your mindset. You really have very little idea how to shift your lifestyle, very little idea how to create an eating strategy that actually works for you. And once you start hearing these things over and over again, you're like, holy shit, that makes a lot more sense. And that's not going to work. And you already knew it didn't work, but now you know why. So great job, Kelly. And I'm glad glad to be that for you. Carolyn says 20 pounds down naturally. And I feel so strong, so amazing, so powerful. 60 years old and I feel great. That's awesome, Carolyn. It is. That, that's so great. 20 pounds down naturally. Yeah. And I guess that's going to be the new, you'll start to hear that more now, you know, naturally or with, with the medicines. And um, again, I'm not, I'm not shaming anyone on the medicine. Never, never, never. I'm always here to support you. Um, but if you're not on it and you're thinking about it, I think there's natural ways to do it. I know there are. That's what I do all day. <laughs> uh, a great job. Let's see. Let's see. Um, Kimberly says, I just found out medical spas are unregulated too. What's a medical spa? I don't even know what a medical spa is. Is that like a UK thing too? Um, Henrik says, well, I think I'm addicted to alcohol, but I'm not an alcoholic. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I do know what you mean. Kind of like, like I always, like I was a blackout binge drinker for a while there. And, um, Certainly people who are thrown around the alcoholic term. 
Um, but it just never felt, I never felt like an alcoholic. I did feel like I had an issue with alcohol and everyone, you listen, I, I feel like everyone gets to make this decision for themselves. Like, well, we know this, you know, there are full blown alcoholics that, that won't accept it either. So there's that too. But I do also think that there are people, you know, some people identify as an alcoholic, some people don't. I never did. And I did get control over the alcohol. You know, I absolutely did. Uh, I'm excited. I, actually, I just got this book. I don't know if you're still here, Jody, but this came from your recommendation of Brain Over Binge, that book. And in that book, she talks about, oh, what's it called now? I'm blanking on it. Rational Recovery, maybe? I don't know. But it's really interesting to me, and I can't wait to read it. I'll share some of this stuff with you. It's kind of an outlier way. It, it's kind of mainly about alcohol and Alcoholics Anonymous, an alternative to that. But you could use with any addiction. And so... I'm really excited because it's a lot about the voice in your head. And I, I, it sounds really interesting to me, but I'll share some of that stuff with you. Cause I'm always, you know, I will tell you program yourself then. And what I use to help people master their weight, I am always tweaking and improving it. I mean, forever, I will always do that. This is a mission. This is my, my life's work is, is how can I help people master their weight? And so I have been for 30 years crafting, I think the best system on the planet for doing it but I'm always making it better. I'll, I will never stop. I just keep iterating and adding to, you know, things I learn, new things. So this is kind of cool though. So I, I'm looking to see, I just got it today and I'm looking to dig into that and uh, I will share anything that's, that's good from it with you all. Um, Carolyn says, I used to go to McDonald's and my mouth would start salivating. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, listen, you know, speaking of your mind creating real effects, one of them is, you know, if let's say you like cheesecake, it, you know, all of a sudden you would see a cheesecake in front of you Literally, your your brain causes your mouth to start salivating. It starts to have your pancreas start to releasing more insulin in anticipation, you know, those calories and the sugar coming in. And so it sets you up to eat it. This, you know, this gets to the structuring you're eating is, is the absolute foundation of mastering your weight. And I'm realizing lately, you program yourself, then we structure our reading. And I'm just realizing how elegant that model is. It's It's been amazing watching a lot of my clients really just get profound insights by structuring their reading. And it's such a, I guess even me, I haven't realized just how amazing it is. It's very unique. And uh, I'm starting to realize it's essential. It's essential. You can't, I don't think you can lose weight without structuring your reading. I don't believe it. I don't believe you can be an intuitive eater in this environment. I don't believe it. You know, maybe you can do it. You know, so I'll hold back. Maybe you can do it. But I think the vast majority of people cannot intuitively eat enough to lose weight in this environment. It's too hard. But yeah, McDonald's, I used to go to McDonald's too. And it's, it's been so wonderful. I haven't been in a fast food place. Like I said, I, I recently, last like year or two, occasionally I'll bring my kid to go to my Burger King to get like a, one of them impossible Whoppers. But that literally, that's like the first time in 20 years. And I used to eat the shit out of fast food. You know, I, that, that was a regular, regular, like, like five times a week type of eater. You know, it was like a goddamn, it was like a holiday for me when McDonald's would do the two, they would do the two chicken sandwiches for $2. I remember that back when I was in college, it was like, it was like a holiday. I mean, I, I'd be eating I'd be getting four chicken sandwiches. It was just, oh, thank God. Many of us know what you mean. It's an addictive substance. Proceed with caution. Yeah, absolutely. The alcohol is definitely an addictive substance. Oh, I have PCOS too. Yeah, PCOS, again, understand though, I got people in the program that are at PCOS. You can still lose weight, okay? Please understand that. Does it make it harder? Sure. You know, is it is it a real challenge? Sure. But you can still, again, I have never seen anyone that can't lose weight if they if they change their eating, so. Uh, yeah. Biggest says prediabetes is a set of markers. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, but but again, the prediabetes, it's it's such a wide range. I, I mean, again, I, I, I think it's funny it's just, it's a funny designation to me. And plus, I, I don't know, the prediabetes thing, it's kind of like people are like, oh, wait till I get actual diabetes. I, I have found, I have found very often, I, I, my experience has been people like, oh, I'm prediabetic, and then they don't really change much. It, it's just very weird. But that's a whole thing too, you know, I, I think a lot about that, that people can get a diagnosis and it doesn't mean shit to them. They don't internalize it. It, it, that it's a, that's a fascinating conversation of like what actually motivates us, you know? And it's like, we could get certain tests back and then be motivated. And then sometimes we get tests back and it just rolls right off. It's just, it's interesting how that works. Um, well, PCOS, I mean, what I'll say about this I, is the same thing I say about everything that regardless if you got PCOS, Hashimoto's, menopause, insulin resistance, hormonal issues, 
uh, diabetes, whatever you got going on physically, um, pretty much, right? There is, what's it called? I'm blanking on the name now. I don't know if it's lipidemia or something, lipidema. Th there are some things apparently, you know what I mean? That almost pickles your cells in a way that, that it's almost permanent. Um, so I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that these things aren't real physical challenges, but at the end of the day, it always comes down to the amount of calories you're consuming and the lifestyle you're living. So when it comes to people that have actual physical challenges, like in that ballpark that I just said, I think the lifestyle piece is really, really important for you. And when I say lifestyle piece, I mean specifically eight habits um, in order of importance, proper sleep, hydration, relaxation, breathing, nourishment, movement, meditation, gratitude. And as you start weaving these into your life, what happens is these things start to have a positive impact on your physical body, on your physiology, your biochemistry, your hormones, all, all of the, 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 a lot of times the, the negative impacts that these things I mentioned are having on your body, we counteract them with a lifestyle that starts to have positive impacts on them. Now, will that cure it? I, I don't think it'll necessarily cure it, but it does start to be a positive balancing to it. And then ultimately the, the key thing though, is it makes it easier to eat in a way that still allows you to lose weight. Cause even with PCOS, it's still a calorie game. It's always a calorie game when it comes to your weight. If you reduce your average calorie consumption over time, your weight's going to go down. It's, I, I have never seen, I know people tell me that that's not always true. And, and I, and I hear them say that, but I've, I've, I haven't seen the science that ever, I've never seen anyone that cuts their calories down. It doesn't lose weight. So I don't know. But so yeah, same with PCOS. It comes down to your eating. That's what I, um, it always comes down to the eating. Metabolic dysfunction that if not reserved or treated, it will lead to type two diabetes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I know like, yeah, anyways. Mm. See, nah, whatever. I'm going to let that one go. Trisha says, I've watched that video multiple times and entered my email and never got the free session. Trisha, you know, and I, I know I feel bad about this. Okay. So why is that? Why can you please Trisha email me? Cause I need to get your email address. So email me at Jim at program yourself then.com. Cause I need to get your email address. Cause once I get your email address, I can look it up. I can't just use Trisha cause there's a million Trishas. And so I, so shoot me an email. Or, or or message me through TikTok if you want, um, but let me know what email you entered, and I will I will get this fixed. I promise. But you got to message me because as soon as I get off these lives and everything goes right out of my head, and I got other work I got to do. But if you message me, I promise you I'll get this fixed. I've, I've seen you say that, um, but I need to get your email address, and and I'll fix that for you. All right. Um, Sandra says very difficult. Families are hard. Families are hard. Families are hard. Relationships are hard. I would say relationships are probably one of the biggest difficulties when it comes to changing your behaviors. You know, it was for me, was for me. There's a lot of reasons for it. I'll just frame some of it. I know a lot of times we get pissed off at these people. Like, hey, you should be supporting me. You should be helping me. And they don't. It's like we take it personally. But I always look at it like, you know, it's, it's usually it's, it's a it breaks rapport. Like when you start eating healthier and, and living healthier and then starting losing weight, it breaks rapport with these people typically. So um, the, the, you're not gonna like this answer, but a lot of times with family, the best way to handle them and deal with it is to literally almost be more empathetic and understanding for them. Because when you start eating better and getting results, it's like holding a mirror up to them and it's making them, you know, look at, uh, look at themselves when they don't want to. You know, you've been around other people that start eating healthy or whatever when you're not in that mode and you know how it feels. Let's be honest, you know, so they're all feeling that. So I think it is helpful because getting angry at them, that's just leading you back to the food. So you, you, and again, I know what this is like, as I, I did not have familial support. Thank God I, my, my wife was my girlfriend at the time, but so we were kind of able to hunker down together. Thank God. But, um, but honestly, even if she wasn't there, you know, I always say this to people that are in a shitty environment with people that aren't supporting them. What you've got to do is you've got to like double down on your motivation. You've got to be extra motivated, extra clear about why you're doing this. Okay. Um, that's the way you deal with that. And then bringing the empathy and understanding is helpful as well. Um, Joey said the article today talked about how they hired influencers to push obesity, no shaming, but General Mills, they're just pushing out their food products. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When I tell you, Jody. All right. Yeah, you're right. And I, I'm going to read that article. I saw you send that to me. I want to check it out. Um, Jody's referring to an article today. I, I think it was, was that today article? I'm, I'm assuming it was, it was in the Washington post. 
And it was, um, I'll tell you the, the title of the article if you want to look it all up. Because I can't wait to read this. But this is what I talk about all the time. You can't trust anything anymore. And even the body positivity movement, I don't trust it. Like I, 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 again, with the body positivity, I love the part where no shame, no feeling like shit about yourself. I like that part a lot. And I don't like the part where they're like, oh, don't worry, you can be over obese and healthy. I don't, I don't believe that. And um, yeah, it's called as obesity rises, big food and dietitians push anti-diet advice. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to imagine, I say this, I'm very conspiratorial minded and I think you need to be when it comes to weight because there's a, you know, what's a conspiracy? It's just a bunch of people working together in ways to make more money. It's not a mystery. What the fuck? I mean, we don't think, we don't think <laughs> that people are trying to make a lot of money and, and they don't give a shit. It's just like the cigarette companies. They don't want to kill you, but it does kill you. And they're not going to stop because it does because their profits on the line, the same exact things going on with the food. So yeah, that's fascinating to find the general mills is, is pushing them to say that I've always thought that anyways, you know, so I can't wait to read that. Yep. Kellogg's boycott is on <laughs> good. Boycott all that shit. If it comes in a box or a bag, again, I'm not saying never eat it. You know what I mean? I, I think there's a time and a place for any food you want to eat, but that time and a place is, is, is this much. That's the sweet spot, in my opinion. Um, yes, they're not regulated. Please be careful with them. What is, what is a medical spa, though? Oh, medical spas are not a UK thing. <laughs> What the hell is a medical spa then? Now I'm curious. Is that like, like a holistic like ranch type thing you might go to or something? One med spa I know will mark problem areas and permanent marker on someone's skin. Oh, yikes. Oh, my husband went to a medical spa for pellets for testosterone. <laughs> Christ. Oh, there's basically a beauty clinic. Now testing his blood, just six shots in each cheek. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Ah, not surprising. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That's very interesting to me. I, I, I don't know. The medical establishment, I, I, I don't know. I have my own issues with that. I, I love medicine. I, I'm a big fan of medicine. But again, I look at, you know, you follow the money, right? They taught us that with, with Watergate. You always just follow the money. And um, I think the medical establishment, you know, their business model is about treating the symptom, not finding the cure. So there's that, <laughs> um, you know, again, if you go to your doctors now, right. With, with a medical a weight issue, what are they going to tell you? Do you think, what do you think you're going to start hearing from your doctor when you walk in there? Right. They used to say, you might want to think about losing weight, but now what are they going to say to you? You might want to think about going on the medicine. That's what they do. You know, when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, um, when you go to a doctor, you're going to get prescribed medicine, but then there is this, this subclass. I know you're not going to like what I say here, but Again, I, I take the, the, the no bullshit, bullshit oath. And um, I know I'm going to make you all mad because I know a lot of people, I'm kind of al alternative and I know I'm going to make you mad, but just realize you can disagree with someone and still like some of the things they say. But chiropractors kind of fall in this, this category. Um, osteopaths, th there's certain, there are certain categories of, of, of medicine that are below the medical establishment that I think you should watch out for because I think, again, we live in a medical, we live in the information age where there's studies that can prove anything you want. And I think it becomes a very dangerous time. So exactly like what you're telling me, you know, you know, so I don't know. I, I've been involved in that world. That's why I say, listen, I'm a yoga instructor. I'm a meditator. I've been vegetarian. I used to do a raw food diet years and years ago. I've been around these people. I've been around the natural health world. And, um, I like some of the stuff and I don't like some of the other stuff. You know, that's like, how, I think that's how you look at everything. You take what works, discard the rest. I think that's the way to go because I don't think you can trust any body of whatever. Cause what, what would you trust? No one seems to have all the answers as far as I can tell. I mean, shit, when it comes to your fucking weight, I, I, I ask this every day. This drives me insane, insane. I don't want to be doing this. <laughs> Do you understand? Like, I wish, I wish there was like, I wish Oprah Winfrey actually understood weight mastery and she was out there doing this shit and I would be doing personal development. <laughs> like, but it's like, I don't, I don't know why no one's talking about weight mastery. I don't know why no one talks about mindset with weight. I don't know why, but no one does fucking no one. I ask every day, please give me a name. I get Lana and I, I appreciate Lana. She's fine, but it's like kindergarten. You know, and it's like, I don't know. I don't know why there's not like 
super smart people with lots of money and resources behind them developing some of the stuff I'm talking about, you know, but I don't see it. So yeah, I always say that if you know someone who's, who's, who do you learn mindset for weight loss from? Just give me a name, any name, please. Do you know anyone? I mean, have you ever heard of anyone? I'm getting to that point. I, I wasn't always asking the question like, so I just say, well, you know, tell me someone on a national level that you can look. Now I just say, tell me anyone. Who do you learn mindset ba based weight? And again, I'm saying weight loss because no one uses the term weight mastery because everyone just wants to lose weight. No one wants to live at their goal weight, apparently. Everyone just loves the roller coasters of weight loss. But uh, yeah, who's the mindset person? Who do you learn mindset from? Yeah, so if he says intuitive eating is meant for recovery, not weight loss. I think that's a good distinction. I think that's a good distinction. I think that's true. I, I say it all the time. Like, if you're overweight, you're, you're not anywhere close to intuitive eating. You know what I mean? Like, your intuitions are what make you overweight. You, you would have to retrain your intuitions. I'm much more, like, I can trust my intuitions, but I can't intuitive eat, like, like my definition of intuitive eating has changed a lot over the years where it's like, I used to think, Oh, intuitive eating, you just be around the food and you just naturally make good decisions. And now I realize I couldn't do that. I need to have structure. So I, I could never not have structure and just manage my weight. I could never do it. Uh, I need the, I need the, the tracks of structured eating to, to adhere to. So even intuitive eating for me has changed a lot. And without the structure, I don't think I could just take away my structure and I'm just going to eat when I'm hungry. I'll stop when I'm satisfied. And then I'll just, I, I can't do that because uh, I can eat and then I can eat some more and then I can eat some more and then I can eat some more. And so, you know, that's me now 30 years into it. And I'm a master of my weight. I, I say as far as weight mastery goes, I'm at the top of the top of the list. I'm the, I'm the Michael Jordan, of weight mastery. I really mean that because I'm like, I'm a Kobe Bryant, a weight mastery. I, I, I like basketball. Kobe Bryant's known as he wasn't the most athletic guy relative to other people in the thing, but he was absolutely obsessed with the process of getting great at basketball. And that's what I am. I'm absolutely obsessed with weight mastery. And so you could take my brain, put it in anyone's body on the planet, and we're going to start losing weight not just going to cut calories, but because I have such an in-depth strategic understanding, mindset, lifestyle, eating to get my weight to where I want it to be. And no one ever knows any of this stuff. You know, this is part of the program. As a concept, it's to help people stop putting obsessive rules around what they can have. Yeah. Um, I get that, Sophie. And I, and I agree with all that stuff. I think, um, yeah, intuitive is just a funny word. And I think a lot of people don't have a real clear definition of what that means. I think intuitive in and of itself is a vague term. Right. But I get what you're saying because I'm, I, the obsessive rules, I think is a huge problem. The obsessive rules of dieting are there intentionally by, <laughs> here we go. You want to like conspiracies? Uh, I think all the diets that you're referencing, the reason you're struggling to lose weight if you're a dieter is because you think like a dieter. And you think like a dieter because you've been conditioned and trained to think like a dieter by all the diets. And all the big diets that you reference how to lose weight from are all owned by big food companies. Weight Watchers was owned by Heinz. Jenny Craig was owned by Nestle. Atkins Food Products is owned by the same company that owns Carvel Ice Cream and Cinnabon. Uh, Slim Fast owned by the same company that owns Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. So if these diets were effective in helping them lose, helping people lose weight, then they would never put those out there. Because why would you actively promote something that makes people not get your product? It's because it doesn't. It doesn't help you not lose weight, right? You as a dieter, the dieting is the thing that causes you to be obsessed with food. It's called the counter-regulatory effect. The more you regulate your eating, the more you end up overeating once you get sick of regulating it. And this describes your eating in a nutshell. You can do your diet for a week or two, and then you're overeating for months. And so it's this constant seesaw, you know, this roller coaster ride you put yourself on where you're strictly, you know, restricting, and then you can't keep it up anymore, and now you're eating everything. Again, it's called the what the hell effect or the counter regulatory effect. And these diets know that. That's why I think these food companies push the diet, the diet thinking, because it leads to you overeating their bullshit food ultimately. You know, thin dieters, no thin and healthy dieters. When you think of a dieter in your mind, you think of a thin, healthy person, or an overweight person. You fucking diet forever. You be, are you going to get keto plan forever? Is that what you're going to do? Unless you got some food allergies, you're not going to be on a keto plan forever. You're never going to eat a piece of pizza again. Never going to eat a piece of cake or a cookie again. 
Oh, yeah? Is that the life you want to lead? Then why haven't you been leading it? <laughs> yeah. Carolyn says, it's an excellent talk. So interesting. Thanks. So you're welcome, Carolyn. I like when they're when they're interesting. I can't get over the American Heart Association and recommending red meat in the diet. I mean, you know, there's a lot of money at play. That's all I'll say about that. And you really do. You got to learn for yourself. You've got to take this on yourself, folks. No one's helping you. There's me. I'm I'm doing everything I can to help you. But um, uh, the, the big powers that be, there's, they're just not there to help you. I, I would tell you, who do you listen to? I mean, like, like big people relatively. Dr. Greger, I think, is brilliant. A ray of light in the world. Um, Dr. Ornish, I think, ray of light. Um, I, I'm not going to start naming everyone, but, but there's a lot of people that are ray of lights. But as far as like big ass organizations, uh, there's a lot of financial money at stake. And so you get what you get. You know, you got to do your own. Oh, and then you do your own research and then that's a rabbit hole where your chances of success doing your own research are really slim. Unless, unless I will tell you this, unless you aim at not just weight loss, but who do I want to live like? You know, that that's the big thing. That becomes the real clarifying question is not like which plan is going to make me lose the weight the fastest. If you can change that to which plan is going to help me live at my goal weight for the rest of my life on your autopilot. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, that's the big question. And I think that starts to clarify things and, and strip away the extraneous bullshit. <laughs> I love that. Um, cause you know, I was thinking, I'm like, the keto thing is hilarious to me. Cause I was like, I love keto. People are always on it for like less than a month. It seems you rarely find a keto person has been doing it for a year. I mean, you find lots of keto people that have been trying to do it for five, 10, 20, 40, 50 years, keto, Atkins, paleo, whatever but you rarely find someone who's actively doing it the way they want to for a long time. Why is that? It's not a trick question, folks. <laughs> Why did you stop your keto plan? Why do you struggle to do it? Why do you struggle to get yourself to start doing it? It's, it's not a trick question. Why? Why does it happen? It's because it sucks. Because you don't want to do it. It's fucking miserable. You don't feel good. It's hard. It sucks. Quality of life goes down. I'm just, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It's a duck. Keto sucks. It sucks. So I don't give a shit if you lose a bunch of weight in the beginning. Come on. No society in the world's ever lived keto. This is Eskimos lived that way for, for a couple months, a year maybe, because they can't get any fresh, fresh fruits or vegetables. They live off of whale, whale meat. What are the societies living in keto ketosis? It's weird. <laughs> and you know that. You're not the weird one because you can't do keto. Do you understand that? <laughs> That's a normal response. It's a normal response to cutting fruits and vegetables out of your diet to feel like shit. He says being diagnosed doesn't necessarily mean that that person will make lifestyle changes. True, true. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, the diet. I don't know. It's such a funny thing. Like I, I just did that. And I know people have been asking for it. And if you're in the program, I'm going to, I'll get to the motivation thing. The motivation thing I've been doing was for people that weren't in the program. Um, because you got access to the full motivation training, but then I realized this is a cool thing. I'll put this in the program too, because it's a, it's a 15 minute video. You know, that's why I say, if you're not in my world, go to my bio, click the link, get the hypnosis session, get on my email list. Cause I'll, I'm going to put the motivation training in the spark program as well. So you have access to that. Um, but for people that are in the program, I've been getting some people, I, I will put that in the program, the members area, and you'll be able to access it. Cause it is a nice shot of motivation. And so I'm trying to do that because again, you know, they did a study. This was very kind of discouraging, but they did a study of men. I oh, forget all the specifics now. I feel like it was men over 60 that had heart issues, like intense heart issues. And I forget the exact cutoff line. I don't think it wasn't just heart attacks, but it was far along heart disease. And they were said about 20% of them made lifestyle changes. 80% of them did not. And so that does reveal the fact that motivation's not enough. You know, motivation does a lot of the work, but ultimately it comes down to mindset and strategy to be able to master your weight. You can't just rely on just white hot motivation forever. Okay. You've got to develop the mindset and strategy that, that puts it on autopilot, you know? Um, but yeah, internalizing, internalizing what's going on with you weight wise to turn into motivation to, spark you. That's what, by the way, the spark program is all about motivation. Spark to spark you 
How do you, how do I, that I think about this all the time. How do I get someone to like internalize what's going on with their weight and their body in a way that actually gets them to take action? I do this like, you know, shit. Every day I do this, I say, hey, go get the free hypnosis and go watch the free video I made. Go get the free emails I send, get the free Spark program I give you. And like 10, 15% of people do it, you know? So it's like, you know, most people are walking around, oh, I don't want to lose weight, I don't want to lose weight. And they don't do anything to make it happen, you know? And I get it. I know there's so much apathy and all the rest of it. But um, yeah, what you're saying, but yeah, it's, it's very true. Yeah, being diagnosed with anything doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be motivated. It's It's fascinating. What's the difference? I will tell you the difference. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, the difference between like being diagnosed with something and actually that triggering you and sparking you to do something in the psychology world is called internalization. Have you internalized what this means? And that's what the motivation training I put together attempts to do. It's to internalize the situation you're in with your weight in a way that actually is meaningful to you. And I do that very systematically. I've been doing this for 20 years professionally. So I'm pretty good at getting you motivated to want to wanna make a change. And so, yeah, that, that training's uh, free for anyone on my email list. Um, Trish says, okay, yeah, send me through TikTok because I'll get it. Okay, cool, you sent it. I will check that as soon as I get out of here because I know you've been asking and I, I, I'll fix that right away. Um, the worst part is the influencers were dietitians. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Joe, Jody's talking about that article that she's talking about like dietitian influencers, you know, basically pushing the anti-diet. Now I'm anti-diet, but I'm not anti-weight loss. You know, that's what I don't like about the body positivity movement is, um, again, I, I like the part where it's like, yeah, no more shame, stigma, bullshit with being overweight. I love that part. But then it's the follow-up message of, Oh, you're, you're healthy as you are. No, you're not. So, so I'm body positivity and pro weight loss. And that's why I get a lot of bullshit from people because of that. They get very triggered because I'm talking about weight loss and being at your goal, being thin and healthy. And, um, I don't give a shit, you know, Hey, you know, hear what I'm saying. I'm not talking about being under, undernourished, underweight and being sick. I'm not saying that in any way. I'm not saying your weight defines who you are as a person. I'm saying, and I use the term thin specifically, that thin means you are at your goal weight. What's your goal weight? The weight that gives you the best quality of life. You get to choose what weight you want to live at. You're choosing it right now. You're choosing to be overweight if you're overweight. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You choose your weight. Don't believe it? Let me know. I'll take you through it. Yes, you are. You're choosing to be overweight. You choose your weight. So yeah, the influencers, the dietitians, by the way, dietitians and nutritionists aren't going to help you lose weight most of the time. Because your problem is not that you don't know what to do. Your problem is you don't know how to get yourself to do it. So you could have the perfect, you know, from, from up on high, you know, uh, the, the perfect meal plan the dietitian creates for you. Do you think that's, that's what the missing piece was? <laughs> oh, that was the problem. You know, that's not the problem. I'm not saying that can't be part of the problem, a small part of it. It's not the main problem. If that was the main problem, everyone would be going to see nutritionists and dietitians and, and their weight would be fixed. And then it's, it helps. It helps to know what to eat and have a crafted meal plan for it. Maybe it does it even. I'm not even sure if it does. So anyways, I love dietitians and nutritionists. I think there's a place for that, but I don't know. I wouldn't be following any influencers that, that are dietitians and nutritionists because they're going to tell you what to do, which is literally 100% of the weight loss industry is people telling you what to do. And then you are left on your own to try and get yourself to do it. And that's where everything falls apart. You don't know how to get yourself to do anything. You can force yourself to do some shit for a little while, and then you go back to what you normally naturally do. That's how it always goes. So um, do you track calories? I do not track calories. Uh, now, I'll proceed this conversation by saying that there's no right or wrong. There's only what works for you. So I know some people that track calories, they love it. It works for them, and it's, they succeed with it. Most people do not like to track calories because it's 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 kind of unnatural. It's an unnatural way to approach your food. Um, but again, it, it, it's what works for you. So I start with that. Um, I don't like tracking calories because I find it to be pretty energy intensive. And most people are kind of, you know, you don't have an abundance of energy. So I think it's important that you set yourself up for long-term success and that is not a strategy that's going to include have to have you track every single calorie you put in your body. So I'm not a huge fan of tracking calories as a long-term strategy. 
Uh, women do the pellets too. For me, and it was expensive. <laughs> yeah, Maggie, I get it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'll tell you this. One thing I've learned over my years: there's no. I've never heard of pellets, but I'll just add it to the list without even knowing about them. I already tell you: there's no pills, there's no teas, there's no powders, there's no pellets. A lot of this shit starts with P, I guess, huh? Be be wary of P things, but there's no there's no you know plants from the Amazon. There's no chiropractor secrets uh, that make you lose weight. There's no shortcut to mastering your weight. And the sooner you buy into that, the more money you'll save and the better results you'll get because you'll start actually doing the work you need to do. Again, when it comes to weight loss, people are so obsessed with shortcuts that they never just put their work in to just, just fix it, just master it. Like with Program Yourself Then, there's the Weight Mastery Pyramid, Mindset, Lifestyle, Eating. There's six categories of mindset eight lifestyle habits and three phases of structuring your eating. Um, and once you know those things, you master your weight. It's the same thing. Like if you want to become a, a plumber, an accountant, even if you don't know shit about numbers, you're not very good with tools. If you go to plumbing school or accounting school, you're going to come out the other end as a plumber and as an accountant. And so you're not approaching your weight like that. You're approaching your weight. Like you're buying a fucking lottery ticket. Well, will this be the time I follow my keto plan? No, it won't be because it never is going to be the time you follow your keto plan because there's nothing different between you now and the you that's failed 50 times to lose weight on the keto plan. Why the fuck would this be any different? It's crazy. You keep doing the same stupid shit and expecting it's going to work instead of learning the pieces of the puzzle that are sabotaging you. <laughs> and so you have no faith, you know, to be honest, I listen, if you're watching this right now, I'm going to, Hmm, I bet you're, you're probably over 40. You're probably an overthinker. You're probably somewhat of a perfectionist. You're probably an overachiever. You're probably pretty successful at work or in your personal life with what you value and you struggle with your weight. I'm close. <laughs> you probably think about your weight 24 hours a day and you can't get yourself to lose weight. And I'm telling you the reason why is because you never add anything new to the mix. Thinking of a new fucking diet is not something new. You never, you never think about your mindset. What do I mean about mindset? I said there's six categories. I break down mindset in the program into your motivation. Do you know how to motivate yourself? No, you don't. Do you know how to change your self-image? Are you even aware of your identity and self-image? Probably not, because right now you currently identify as an overweight person. And until you change that, how are you going to be a thin and healthy person forever? Your habits. Do you have a strategic plan to influence your habits so that they start to reflect what you want them to be? Or do you just try and change all of them one day? Your emotions. Do you know how to deal with your emotions? Do you have strategies that work for you that allow you to feel the emotions you want to feel, deal with the shitty emotions you don't want to feel? Do you? Or do you, your best strategy to deal with emotions is the food? Thinking. Do you know the nuts and bolts of how to think like a thin and healthy person? Do you know questions, the right questions to ask? Do you know how to think about food, exercise yourself as a thin and healthy person would? You don't. And maintenance. Do you know how to keep it up? Do you know how to keep going when you feel discouraged? Do you know how to keep going when you're stressed out in life? And you lose your job. You have to move. Someone gets sick. Do you know how to maintain? I'll let you answer these questions. But if you don't know those six things, how the fuck are you ever going to lose the weight you want to lose? What? Because there's gonna be a new diet. Oh, this is this is this new diet's like keto, but it also adds intermittent fasting to it, so you don't eat for sixteen hours too. Oh, that's where we're going. Because there's no more new diets. What? What? If you think the main thing between you and you living at your goal weight is that you don't know what to eat, you're you're totally missing everything. You're you're, you're lost in the sauce, as my daughter would say. <laughs> So you got to, you got to master. It's not rocket science. It's not as easy as like, oh, I'm just going to stop eating carbs because the diets are built for you that all the diets are built around the one concept philosophy. Think about this. Every single diet you know about is one thing. It's one tactic. Stop eating carbs. Stop eating for 16 hours. Count your points. Track your calories. Eat 1200 calories. Exercise more. Just eat Mediterranean food. It goes on and on. It's always one thing. If you think the only thing between you and your goal weight <clears throat> is making a change in your what you're eating, well, I'll be here. I'll be here forever. So when you realize finally that ain't going to fix it, I'm still going to be here teaching the same shit. <laughs> and it's like, you know, if, if you start learning the, the components of it, 
you're going to master it. And you don't even think about it this way. That's the crazy part. You know, you don't even think about mastering your, I just master my weight, Jim. I just want to lose the weight. Yeah. That's your problem. You just want to lose it. What the fuck's that even mean? What's that mean? I just want to lose it. How about you want to live as a thin, healthy person and you want to master it so that you're in control of it. I'm not worried about my weight because I know how to control my eating and I know how to control my eating because I got a lifestyle that supports the good eating structures and strategies I've created for myself. And I got the mindset under it. That's rock solid. I was joking. I'm like, you dieters, I can blow you off your fucking path. Like, and you're, Oh, oh put a pound on. Oh God. I thought I was doing so. Oh, uh, I didn't lose anything. All, all that. And I didn't lose any weight. I, I don't mean to be a jerk. I don't mean to be that way, but I'm just trying to show you that you feel so lost and you feel so frustrated and apathetic because you're being tricked. You've been tricked by the diet industry to think that the only thing between you and your goal weight is this diet. Think about it. It's a fucking never ending clown show parade of, of strategies. They're not strategies, they're tactics. I mean, I, I love the keto one. I mean, oh, we start with Atkins, it goes to paleo, then it goes to keto. And it's like, I love that one. It's all the same dumb shit. It's like, but God, have you been trying that for 20 years? Have you been trying for 20 years to do that? And you're still trying? I said this on a video the other day. This was, oh, that's persistence. Persistently doing something that doesn't work? That doesn't make any sense to me. But anyways, get carried away. See what you did, Maggie? See what you did to me because you said pellets. <laughs> I'll start with pellets. <laughs> we don't call them med spas in the UK, though. <clears throat> I'll never do chiropractor again. He missed a broken neck, cracking me. Emergency spine surgery. Ay, 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 ay. Yikes. That's the worst one I've heard. And I've heard a lot of them. Uh, yeah, the chiropractor thing. I mean, I'm a hypnotist. So I'm not, you know, I, mean? I, I you know, those in glass houses, but, you know, I'm a unique hypnotist. And, and the, I'll tell you, the, the hardest part of being a hypnotist is not overstating what you can do. I will tell you, I'm going to say this because again, I take the no bullshit oath and I don't even want to say this. I don't want to throw, I like my alternative practitioners and I believe in them a lot, but you've got to watch out for the thing you've got to watch out with uh, alternative health practitioners is them overstating what they can do. That's the biggest thing I see. They overstate a lot and um, with very little backing it. And, and you've got to watch out for that because they'll, they'll crack your fucking spine when you got a broken neck is what will happen. And as you said, Jesus, that's crazy, Don. Weight mastery is the hard part for me. Well, of course it's the hard part, Maggie. You know what I mean? Weight mastery is hard. Like it's it's hard-ish and then it becomes easy. All, all paths of mastery are the same. They're hard at first and then they get easy. And you know this, right? Because, you know, we, we, stop, we stop paths of mastery in school like in third, fourth grade, right? What are paths of mastery? Walking, uh, reading, writing. These are paths of mastery, riding a bike, path of mastery, right? And what's the process? You do it and it feels impossible. Holy shit. I, I'm not, I don't have no idea what I'm doing. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm confused. And then you keep doing it and you start to gain understanding of it. And eventually if you stick with it, it starts to become automatic. Now you can't not read. Now you can't not be able to write. Now you can't not, you could never forget how to ride a bike. It's all automated now. So weight can be the same way, but you need to approach it with that approach in mind. See, I bet, I bet, first of all, no one ever says weight mastery. That's no one's goal. No one uses that term. I, I, as far as I know, I'm, I'm the only one, I've never heard anyone else say that term other than me. And maybe someone does. So I'm not saying that someone doesn't, but I literally have never heard anyone say it. So my goal for you is not to lose weight. I think, I think weight loss is an impoverished, shitty goal. I think the better goal is that you want to get to your goal weight and then live the rest of your life at your goal weight on near autopilot. That's the goal I have for you. And when that's your goal, it's going to take a much different strategy to achieve than weight loss and dieting. Dieting is not a weight mastery strategy. Dieting is not going to allow you to live at your goal weight for the rest of your life on near autopilot. It's not built for that. So how do you live your life at your goal weight for the rest of your life on near autopilot? Well, you got to have the right mindset. You have to implement the right lifestyle. And then you need to create eating strategies that work for you. They're custom made for you that work for you. And now, you know, I sit in front of you. I've been at the same weight for 30 years. I dropped 50 pounds. I went the same weight for 30 years. I had one blip 12 years ago and I have not dieted once. I, I don't even work out. 
I don't work out in any consistent sort of way that impacts my weight. I did it by mastering my eating. And so it's the hard part, but it's extra hard. It's extra hard when you have no idea how to do it. Oh, Aaron says pellets are hormone replacement. Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that those don't work, huh? Um, Vicky says mindset and subconscious mind work is hard and takes time. People want fast results. Yeah. Agreed, Vicky. Uh, absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. That's why, I mean, you really, you, if you, okay, let's say you do want to master your weight. Let's just say that is the goal. Well, the first thing that needs to be addressed is what's your time frame? See, cause as a dieter, that's your biggest challenge. See, see, listen, if you're a dieter, you are literally imprisoned right now. You're in a invisible mental prison put there by the diet industry. You think like a dieter. And the outer bars of that prison are your time frame. All you do is thinking about losing weight and you want to do it as fast as possible. So when we talk about weight mastery, the first thing we got to address is your time frame. Your time frame is fucked, folks. Fucked. Because if I talk about a long-term approach, slow weight loss, you just tune out. You only want fast weight loss. You've been conditioned to think that way. So if you want to master your weight, it's like mastering anything else. We've got to expand the time frame. What can you master in a week, a month, a year? You tell me. But I start this conversation by asking the most important question is how long you want to keep the weight off for? How long would you like to keep the weight off for? I know you want to lose it, but then how long you want to keep it off for? Well, forever, Jim, obviously. Oh, yeah. So obviously. Well, then what are you going to do? You're going to keto it? You're going to do a 1,200 calorie a day forever? The shit. Is that what you're going to do? Because I think a lot of things you're doing to lose weight are unsustainable for you. So weight mastery, you should approach weight mastery like you would college. What if you had? What? Because think about this. All the years you've been trying to lose weight, you haven't learned shit. You've learned a lot of ideas of what you could do, but you're no further along the path. You're stuck in a hamster wheel. You're not moving anywhere. You know as little about how to lose weight now as you did before you started your first diet. Think about that for a second. Let that sink in for a second. You literally know as little about how to lose weight right now as you do before you started your first diet. Now, you have a lot of ideas what you should do. Oh, I know the keto thing I should do. I know to be organic and natural and vegan, whatever your philosophies are. But the actual ability to influence your eating and your lifestyle and your mindset so that you actually weigh what you want you have not learned a single thing. This is why you, you're stuck in this weird ass space. You're not moving anywhere. So until you illuminate and learn those components that really, because wouldn't, how would you feel if all of a sudden, imagine you knew how to motivate yourself. You knew how to transform your self, your self image into that of a thin, healthy person. You knew how to control your habits and influence them. You knew how to experience your emotions, deal with your emotions genuinely without needing any food. You knew how to think like a thin, healthy person. You knew how to maintain even in the most stressful of times. Aren't those things that might be helpful to you when it comes to your weight? And you don't know any of those. And where are you even going to learn them from? You've never even thought about them in the, that way before. You've never thought about mindset that way. Because mindset now is used as a synonym for willpower. I hear it all the time. Come on, you got to have the right mindset. Well, what the fuck does that mean? If I could just have the right mindset, I would just have the right mindset 20 years ago. I don't know how to have the right mindset. That's your problem. You don't know how. And it's because you've never been taught. You're not an idiot. You're a smart person, which is a big part of the problem. Because you spend all your time, you and your smart big brain of yours, spend all your time trying to diagnose what's wrong. And what's wrong is that you've never learned how to think like a thin, healthy person. It does take time. My Cairo helped me get off my couch and move again after four years of chronic debilitating pain. They're not all bad. Fair enough, Erica. And I, and I agree with that too. I think that um, what it is though, let, let's just be honest, alternative medicines, alternative therapies, I will say, exist in an, a relatively unregulated world. And, and that's all I'm saying. Um, and it goes for even massage therapy. There's good ones and bad ones, right? And I definitely think that there are good and bad alternative therapists. There's no question about that. But the challenge is that they are more unregulated. So that, that, it just is what it is. I mean, shit, I'm a hypnotist. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> There's no one regulating me. You know, there really isn't. 
Now again, I'm, I'm, I'm not manipulating people physically, but I'm a yoga instructor too. I've seen yoga instructors that overstate what you can do with yoga. So, so again, I'm just, I'm just sharing you what I think. And I think, I definitely don't think all alternative therapists are bad. And I don't think chiropractors are bad by nature. I think there are a lot of good people that mean a lot of good stuff. Um, and they do help people. But the, the, the whole f science behind it is definitely a little, a little shaky. I think a lot of people have a disbelief in the idea of having a subconscious. I don't doubt that. And I have a disbelief that people have a disbelief in that. Because I say, what the fuck? How you explain it to me? Folks, give me an explanation. You give me the explanation of why there are things you want to do that you don't do and things you want to stop doing that you don't stop doing. You explain to me how that's happening. Give me the explanation because I study a lot of psychology. I have never seen a good explanation for that, in my opinion. Nothing that really, not, not, not a paradigmal explanation of why that happens to every person. You read about abnormal psychology, but what about the normal psychology of every human on this planet who has things they want to stop doing that they keep doing and things they want to start doing that they never start? Someone explain that to me. And so, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think, I think, I don't think it's so much a disbelief in the idea of having a subconscious. I think it's a lack of, of knowledge of what the subconscious is. So, but anyways, you make more sense than anyone who talks about weight loss. You're real. Thank you. You're welcome, Maggie. I do make more sense than pretty much anyone. I will say, because I'm in the real world and, and the big thing I'm doing that's different than, than literally the entire weight loss industry is I'm not just, I'm not telling you what to do. Telling you what to do doesn't work. You know this, don't you? You've been told what to do and you haven't done it. Isn't that the problem? <laughs> you don't know how to get yourself to do the thing you know you should. Now, part of that I will tell you is that you don't really know what to do. <laughs> you really don't. Now, on the, on the service level, you do. Like, you know, you shouldn't eat the ice cream and the cookies and all this other shit, right? So there's that part of it. Um, but you don't know how to get yourself to, you don't know how to change your eating. You don't. And it's because you don't know how to change your mindset. You don't know how to influence your mind, your lifestyle, and you don't know how to actually create strategies, eating strategies that work for you. Damn. Um, I did keep religiously for a year and a half. I'm not kidding. The first time I ate bread, I gained, I gained, um, no, I did keto religiously for a year and a half. I'm not kidding. The first time I ate bread, I gained. Yeah. The keto, and that's what happens. Every, everyone, I don't know. The keto thing, I'm just kind of tired of talking. I talk about it all the time. And it's just, again, if you love keto, so I get, oh, I've been on keto for 10 years and I love it. It's the greatest thing ever. Well, great. I'm not talking about you. There's always outliers. Okay. But the problem with the weight loss industry is that you're following outliers. How many people are going to live a life of not eating a carb? It's not very many people because no one's ever done it. What society are you pointing to? What society are you pointing to that said, no, look at, like, like you know, there's the blue zones. If you're familiar with the blue zones, right? It was a book that came out and I know the keto people, oh, blue zones. Yeah. Cause they'll put down anything that's not their, their paradigm, but the blue zones, basically they look for where the people that live the longest, where they lived, what they, what they eat, how is their lifestyle there? A couple of blue zones. There's so like Okinawa, Japan. There's some place in Italy and it's like, yeah, whatever these places where there's commonalities, a lot of fruits, vegetables, fresh foods, um, limited amounts of, of meat and animal products. Uh, and you know, these are the people that live the longest. You show me the keto zones, show me the keto zones. Where, where, where is the keto societies? Cause what are we basing this on? I know what we're basing it on. We're basing it on the fact that the number one source of calories for Americans is baked goods. <laughs> so we're overwhelmed with flour and refined carbs. And so it's natural that we're going to have an anti-carb diet. And yes, I agree a thousand percent. If you're going to master your weight, you're going to have to get your carb, your refined carb consumption under control. But do you need to cut it out completely? Of course not. And they can come up with all the science they want to. I don't give a fuck about science because you give me the perfect science scenario on the planet, but if no one can follow it, what, what are we doing? And you can tell me all day long about all the science of, of keto and then let me know how you're doing on it. Is, is it, are you thriving on it? 
Because unless you're thriving on it, I don't want to hear from you. I, I don't. I don't want to hear it. Because to me, it's like, I don't give a shit about the perfect plan. I care about, are you able to do it? We've got to take that into account. I think this is this help will help you so much if you can realize this. Because it's so easy to be like, oh, this is the perfect plan. This is what I got to do. And then we never take into account how is it for us to, to live that way. We've got to take that into account. Because if you've been struggling to live the perfect plan for 10 years, maybe it's not the perfect plan. Because isn't the perfect plan, does it have anything to do with how you feel about it? Does it, does that matter at all? Like your, your criteria for what the perfect plan is, is it strictly what it's going to do to your weight and your blood markers and your health markers? Does, does any of the criteria involve how it feels mentally and emotionally to live that way? Sh should that count at all? And if you're going to ignore that, what the fuck? Why would you do that? Because you wonder why you can't stick with this? Why do you think it is? Well, I'm telling you why it is. It's because you don't like doing that. And you're always going to end up doing what you like to do. So you better figure out a way to enjoy how you're going to master your weight. That's what program yourself then is. Because I don't know what else you would do. You know? I don't know how else you would do it. Daydreamer says, I'm looking for a fasting partner. Um, I fast. I'm a binger. I'm struggling between high, raw, vegan, and then not doing it because of rules. But then I feel like I need a regimen in order to follow something. All right, user. So I go back to it. Okay, user, let's talk about this because I was a raw food vegan. Okay. So um, yeah, I did the raw food diet and I learned a ton from that. What I learned is exactly what I was just talking about with you. I did the raw food vegan thing and I I did it for maybe six months, like 100%. And um, it was super hard. But I felt amazing physically. I was like, I was like, oh man, I feel like I'm vibrating. I felt, I felt amazing physically. Okay. But mentally and emotionally, I was absolutely obsessed with food. I mean, obsessed. And I realized the turning point for me, I was driving to work one day. I used to, it was an hour ride for me to get to work. I was driving to work and I was like, what am I going to do if I want to get a promotion? How am I going to celebrate it? And I was like, holy shit. All I do right now is think about food. And that was a breaking point. I said, I'm, I'm not doing anything ever again where I get so obsessed with food. Okay. So user, I get, you do need a regimen. You absolutely, listen, I'm telling this to all of you. You need a regimen. You need to structure your eating. I don't think you can, if anyone out there ever loses weight without structuring their eating, please contact me. I want to interview you. Okay. I have never once in my life seen someone who's successfully mastered their weight who is not structuring their eating. Okay. So yes, user, I do think you need a regimen, but the regimen, you need to have structure to it, but you can have more flexibility within that structure. Okay. So again, go to my bio, click the link, get the hypnosis session. I can even watch the video I made for you. It, it goes through some of this stuff. All right. Um, Carolyn says, wow, you're excellent. Thank you. Um, Ellie says I needed this. Yeah, good. Um, user 808 says, what's the plan? What's the plan? Um, the plan starts with the weight mastery pyramid, getting your mindset, lifestyle, and eating under control, right? So, so my program, we have the weight mastery blueprints where you fill out your mindset, lifestyle, eating blueprints. They're customized to you and you create them and you follow them and you tweak and optimize them in service of creating the perfect plan for you. I have, and so ultimately it comes down, when it comes to weight, it comes to eating, but the eating is at the top of the pyramid. You need a foundation under it. And that's the lifestyle, and the mindset piece. But let's talk about the eating for a second, because I know that's what everyone it, it wants to think about. And so the eating uh, is really built around structuring your eating. And the main thing we do is we do five days of clean eating, two days of pleasure eating. Understand this is a philosophy. So it's always based around you. You figure out how it works best for you. But it's the idea, what we need to have, I believe, is we need to have contrast. We need to have clean days where our intention is to fuel our body as cleanly and as effectively as possible. And then we have pleasure days where we enjoy the foods we want to eat. So it's more fun food. Okay. We're, we're doing it for pleasure, fun, and we're doing this for fuel nourishment. And again, it doesn't have to be five, two, you could start one day clean, six days of pleasure. It doesn't matter. It's having these, these kind of guardrails with them, right? That this is a clean day. These are pleasure days. We start there because it starts to allow your mind to recognize cause and effect. 
and we start to optimize to the clean days. We have, again, ideally we want to optimize around meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. You may only want to eat one meal a day, two meals a day, five meals a day. That's up to you. But we want to get from meal to meal to meal to meal comfortably. And so we start figuring out what can I eat for breakfast that's in my calorie ranges and that's relatively easy, relatively enjoyable that gets me to lunch. What can I eat at lunch gets me to dinner. And we work on that. You don't know what that shit is yet. And you may snack in between in the beginning. But again, the, the point is to ultimately get to, I eat this for breakfast, gets me to lunch comfortably. I eat this for lunch, gets me to dinner comfortably. Now you're, now you're in the game. Okay. Now we worked on optimizing that and we structure, okay, here's my breakfast. Here's my lunches. Here's my dinners. And then we do the exact same thing for pleasure days. That's the big difference. We have pleasure days, but they're structured too. But the pleasure days are absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. So that's kind of a general thing of it, but, um, it's, a that's a, an overcome a, a, a overview of it. Uh, is the hypnotism compulsory? Um, it's not, I mean, there is a hypno, I, I, you know, there's two main parts of the program. There's the blueprints that I just talked about, and there's the program yourself then technique, which is a hypnosis technique you use to program your own subconscious mind. You've got to learn how to do this. If you don't believe your subconscious mind's running your weight, then skadoodle, it, this isn't for you. Okay. But if you start to understand, and again, you, I would suggest watching my video first. So opt in, get the hypnosis session, watch the video. Let me explain to you what your subconscious mind is, see if it makes sense. Um, you probably don't know what it is. And so it's a real simple concept. And once you start to understand this part of your mind, you understand how to influence it, it's a game changer. And so you need to learn how to influence your own subconscious mind. Now, that being said, there is a lot of hypnosis in the program because hypnosis is so powerful in helping to change your mindset. It's not goofy shit like you've seen in the movies. It's like commercials. Commercials are hypnosis, right? When you watch a movie or a TV show, that's hypnosis. You're sitting there passively imagining you're in the scenario you're watching and you're having experiences from what you're watching. You watch a comedy, you laugh. You watch a horror, you're nervous. So you're having physiological responses to what you're imagining. That's hypnosis, but you're not using it intentionally. It's being used on you. So you have to learn how to do it yourself, I believe. So um, I would say it's pretty compulsory. If you don't like hypnosis, I would not suggest this program. Um, what are your thoughts on bariatric surgery and medications like Ozempic and Manjuro? Um, my thoughts on bariatric surgery is that, uh, you know, and it's funny, I was just talking to Aaron with this. I don't know if Aaron's still here. So I'm gonna ask her, she gave me a stat. If you're still here, Aaron, what was the stat you said the other day? Cause now I'm thinking it was nine out of 10, but, um, regardless of what the specific stat is, bariatric surgery fails ultimately usually more than it succeeds. And again, I, I think there's no better example that your weight is really a mindset issue than bariatric surgery. Because you will regularly see bariatric people put the weight back on after a year or so. And so think about that. Their stomach's this big and they still put the weight back on. How much more could it be obvious that it's a mindset issue? And I've worked with plenty of people with this. A lot of times like, I got to lose 20 pounds to get the surgery. And I said, shit. I'm like, you can do it. But I'm like, if you're good, can you just keep the door open that maybe you could just do all the weight with this way? You know, but people get something in their head sometimes. That's how it is. But so um, again, I think the bariatric surgeries, the Ozempic, the Manjuro's, I think that they treat the symptoms and they don't deal with the core problems. And so I do have a lot of people in the program and I've worked with people now that have been on Zempic and Manjuro and um, it doesn't solve the core problem, you know, which is that you don't know how to, how to have the right mindset, lifestyle and eating strategies to manage your weight. And so you, you put this little bandaid on it. As I heard a doctor explain the best description I've heard that uh, the Ozempic is kind of like, say you're in quicksand sinking down and someone throws you a shovel. You know, and so you're still sinking, but you're just sinking slower, you know, and it kind of just helps you out. So it's not, it's not a resolution. It's not a fix. It's, um, you know, it's just a, it's a bandaid. It's a tool to kind of help manage something for people that have no idea what to do. So again, that's why Oprah Winfrey kind of drives me crazy. I made a whole video on the, um, I made a whole video on Oprah's big weight loss special she did. Um, but I think that, I think that, uh, you know, she, she never talks about the real solution. And so I don't know. And then we'll see what Ozempic does. I don't know. Like I, I just, we'll see whatever effects it has, but it's not, it's, it's a tool. It really is a tool anyways. Cause you know, listen, just, I think you probably know this. Maybe you don't. Ozempic doesn't magically like boost your metabolism. So you do everything the same and now you just lose weight. What it does, what the effect of it typically from people I've talked with and a lot of people is it makes you feel sick. You feel low key nauseous a lot and it's easier to not eat as much. So 
you know, th there's a lot of ways to get those effects without needing Ozempic. And I, I again, I tell I deal with that with people in my program. So it's not until they create strategies that they really are able to master this thing. So that's my experience. Um, you're the person who's helping me get to my ideal weight and stay there forever. Thank you. You're welcome, Vicky. And again, you're the one putting the work in. So again, I, I always like, I, I hate the word guru because it's, it's got weird connotations now, but, but guru in India means bringer of light. And um, not to sound so corny here, but, but I like to think of myself as I, I'm, I'm trying to bring light because I know you're all smart. The only people that listen to me are overthinkers because I'm talking too fast. I'm talking about all this such a shit. So I know the only people that listen to me are overthinkers and overthinkers. Listen, folks, the overthinking is not your problem. The problem is what you're overthinking. You're overthinking the problem. You're obsessed with the problem. What's that look like? Tell me this, this sounds familiar. You are constantly stuck in a mind conversation with yourself of what's wrong with me? Why can't I stick to a plan? Why do I keep eating like shit? Why can't I eat better? Why do I keep struggling with the weight loss? Why do I keep putting the weight back on? Am I ever going to do this? It's, it's all about the problem. And you're obsessed with trying to figure it out. But what you don't realize is your subconscious mind does not understand negatives. Right? I tell you, don't think about a banana. What fruit are you thinking about? Yeah. So when you keep thinking about what's wrong with you, why am I overweight? Why am I an overeater? You keep reinforcing the neural pathways of being an overeater, of overeating, of being overweight, of being out of control. And you're stuck in that where you're, you're constantly reinforcing being this person. How often are you asking yourself, how could I lose weight easily and comfortably? How could I make living at my goal weight comfortable and automatic? How could I enjoy the process? How could I love eating healthy foods? You're never asking those questions. And once you start asking them, you start aiming all your, your mental power at the solution. And it changes things like that. It's crazy. That's why I do what I do. And that's why I work with who I work with. You know, I could sit here. I could easily, I could be making millions of dollars selling a hypnosis program. I could go the Paul McKenna route. No problem. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to sit here and say hypnosis just magically fixes everything. I'm not going to bullshit you. You know, it does take thought. It takes work. Oh, thanks, Carolyn. That's a cool one. Um, so yeah. So, so you know, again, for my, my people, and again, I know you're all my people because it's like you're overthinkers and you're, you're tortured by that, but it's because you're, you're, you think, you know, you think the more I think about this, the quicker I'll get to some mental breakthrough is going to change it all. You think if you knew why you were struggling that all of a sudden, because you knew that it would just fix it. And I'm here to tell you it won't. It's like saying, you know, it's like you're obsessed with, you never played the piano. Why don't I play the piano? How come I can't play a song? Why don't I know chords? Why don't I, why don't I do that? Instead of taking the time to learn how to play the piano. Um, Laurel says, I was always fit, hit menopause and gained 25. My face is even fat. I don't want to leave the house. Yeah, that sucks, Laurel. It's, it's tough. Um, it's That's a tough situation, but it's also a benefit, okay? What if you've lost your self-image after being fit and attractive all your life? Need it now. Yeah, okay, Laurel. This is this is an interesting conversation for me. Again, the benefit you have, let me tell you, you you're in a better spot than other people. It's nice to appreciate where we're at when we look at things relatively. And what I mean is, you compare to someone who has been overweight their whole life, that's a lot harder. I'll just be honest. If you've been overweight your entire life, that is a harder path to walk because you're literally creating a self-image out of thin air. What you need to do, Laurel, is you need to change, you need to update your self-image. You're not the younger Laurel anymore. You're going to be the older Laurel. And I know that might hurt a little bit. That's what you got to do though. And it becomes, who do I want to be now moving forward? And I know you can drop the 25 pounds because when people say they hit menopause and gain 25 pounds, they make it seem like I did everything's exactly the same, but I just put 25 pounds on. That is rarely the case. A lot of times what happens is you start having menopause, you start going through emotional dips and, and things. You start believing in your mind, oh, menopause, here comes the weight. You start not even realizing you're eating more. And um, I, listen, my whole career has been helping women in some phase of menopause master their weight. So what you need to do again, is you want to, you need to upgrade your self image. And, and I'll tell you, this happens a lot. Here's what I think with the menopause, take it or leave it. I'm just going to throw it out there. And this isn't a hundred percent, but I see this a lot. I think part of what happens with the menopause is I think women are going through a self image shift anyways. Right. And it's official. It's like, it's official. It's like turning 50. Right. I'm going to turn 50. It, it, it's, a, it's like a, it's this fucking line in the sand. Right. And it's like, okay, there was younger me and now there's older me. And I think that in of itself is something that needs to be dealt with in terms of weight. 
And so I think that the job for you now, Laurel, is to update your self-image. You didn't lose shit, okay? You need to take yourself now and say, who do I want to be? And by the way, um, I haven't said this yet, but program yourself then, the philosophy is that we take your weight loss and wrap it in personal development. So program yourself then is really not just a weight loss program. It's a personal development program where you lose weight. And so for you, Laurel, what I would say is the question you want to start asking is who is the best Laurel possible? Who is me at my best? That's where I would start with. I would defocus on the weight part of it. And I would start focusing on who is the best version of me possible. Now, part of that's your weight. Part of that's how you look, how attractive you are, the rest of it. But now we want to add more to it. You know, again, I don't know what your situation, I don't know the relationships you have. Maybe you're a mom, maybe you have a partner, maybe you're a sister, a daughter. I don't know the, the roles you play in life, but it starts to become about that. How can I be the best version of myself possible? And one aspect of that's weight. And I think when you start to look at things that way, it's going to be very important for you because I will tell you, women do this all the time. I'm just going to be honest here. Women do this sometimes, especially if you've been attractive during your life and you identify as that, that becomes a trap in of itself because you start to feel, well, I'm getting older and you're not going to be attractive in the same way you were when you were younger. And we need to make peace with that. Again, I'm just, I'm not, I'll never lie to you. And I'm not saying this is, this is what you're going through, but I'm telling you what I've seen a lot in my experience. And I've done almost 6,000 private weight loss sessions. So I'm not just making this shit up. I'm telling you what I see. And I tell you the hard things sometimes because sometimes the hard things are the things we don't want to face. So if the, any of these things are appropriate to you, it can be helpful to actually acknowledge them. Uh, Kathleen says, so true, mind blowing. I love that you don't hold back. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, are you suggesting, are you suggesting sustainable moderation? I am absolutely suggesting that. Yes, sustainable moderation. What else? What, how else would you ever master your weight? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it one point further just to really prove the point. I was doing a coaching call yesterday and someone got on, they go, um, I'm having trouble maintaining my calorie deficit. And I said, well, fuck that calorie deficit. We do not want to refer to it as a calorie deficit because referring to something as a calorie deficit makes you feel like it's less than normal. What we're looking to do is to create a new normal. You're not looking to create a deficit. We're looking to create a new normal level of consumption, calorie consumption that gives you the weight that you want to live at. Even the language we use of what we're doing, language is so important because your subconscious mind is like a computer. And the word you, the coding you put into a computer is very important for what you get out. And it's the same thing with your subconscious mind. You can't be all loosey goosey with stuff. Like even losing weight, you know, losing weight. How the fuck you lose weight? You tell me. Because I'll tell you something, you can't lose weight. How would you lose weight? Lose it today. Take, get on your scale now and then lose weight. You can't lose weight. What you can do is you can eat better, you can live healthier, and over time, magically through some process, the scale goes down and the weight goes down. But you can't lose weight. Weight loss, right, there's cause and effect. Weight loss is an effect of your better eating and living. So it, the weight's a reflection of what you're doing. And a lot of times with the weight, we're always focused on the outcome and we're getting so distracted. It's like, that's not, that's not the game. The game is the process. And so sustainable moderation, Laurel, yes, that's what we're looking to do. That's what I've created. I've mastered sustainable moderation. I have reduced my calorie consumption to the level, the weight that I want to live at. And I've learned how to do that consistently and comfortably in a way that really works for me. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm glad you said that. Any tips for big family style dinners where I don't have much choice in making great choices? Um, yeah, Heather, for sure. So the secret with big family style dinners, and I deal this every week with my mom. My mom makes dinner every week, and um, it's always pastas and, and easy, easy to overeat foods. Let's put it that way. So just real simple, and we can talk more about this, Heather, because we can go deeper into it. But um, one thing you want to do is, A, you already know, so you have a sense of it. So I would rehearse how you want to eat in the situation. Okay. A lot of times we do what we did. So if you've overeaten in the past, you're going to overeat in the front. So we want to rehearse. How do you want to behave in this situation? Um, the next step is we want to go into the situation set up to succeed. So when I go to my mom's every Thursday night, we have dinner there. I'll usually eat my lunch a little bit later than I normally do because now I'm walking into dinner feeling more satisfied and full. And now it's easier for me to make healthier choices. Um, you could drink a glass of water 15 minutes before dinner um, have an apple an hour before dinner. You can make sure you're calm and relaxed when you sit down for dinner. 
You could practice eating with your left hand at dinner. You could um, imagine in your mind consuming less, talking more. You know, there's a lot of strategies that are there. It's figuring out which ones work for you. Okay. So start there and then we could talk about that more. Um, do you still eat your favorite foods? Absolutely. I've not eliminated a single food. I mean, I don't eat, I don't eat fast food anymore, but I don't like fast food anymore. Okay. But I still like um, cupcakes, cookies, pasta, pizza, burritos. I still eat all the things I like to eat. I eat less of them. Okay. I change the way I eat them, but um, I, there's not a single food that I want to eat that I don't let myself eat. There are foods that I've outgrown because I've learned about them. So I eat, I don't eat a lot of processed food. I don't eat much junk food. I don't eat any fast food. Um, no, I don't eat any fast food. I never do. So, um, but, but that's been a natural evolution because I've learned about these foods. So I don't want them anymore, you know? And so it takes as much willpower as it takes for you not to smoke cigarettes or do heroin, which is, it takes zero for you because you don't want to do those things. I don't want to eat those foods. The foods I do still enjoy eating, um, I eat more moderately. Again, I've structured them. So I still have them in my life, but I've structured the way I eat them. And so I'm still able to, I like to say, right. That, what they say like, uh, how do you have your cake and eat it too? I like to say, how can you eat your cake and have your body too? And if you start thinking that question, you'll come up with strategies and solutions to do it. Dieters are all or nothing. And that screws them up. I'm um, making sure to eat well breakfast and lunch, but on vacation, these dinners are messing with my mind. I get it, Heather, but you know, you, you've got to frame vacation eating is vacation eating. And, and it just, it, it's its own category. Holiday eating's like that too. Um, we've got to grade ourselves within context. And what I'll tell you, now, I usually say 80-20, but I bet I have a feeling you're a 90-10 person. But um, the 80-20 that I say to most people is focus on the 80% of your eating. The 80% of your eating is the eating that you do consistently, which means the eating you do at home, you know, unless you go on vacation every other month or every month, which you probably don't. And so we want to master the 80%. And again, for you, it's probably 90%. Um, so that when the vacations come, it, it, it just, it doesn't matter. A week, it doesn't matter what you do during a week. That's not what's dictating your weight. Okay. So, so just, I get it's messing with you a little bit, but again, put it in context. It's not going to make, make a shit of difference. I promise you. So just do what it is, do what you're doing and realize that when you get back home, that's what does it. <laughs> I tell everybody this, is this like remote viewing? I don't know what that means. I wouldn't watch Oprah's show. Yeah. It's fucking stupid. Oprah. I like Oprah, but I, I don't appreciate her weight loss stuff at all. Um, Sonia says, I had a gastric bypass though. I didn't gain all my weight back. I gained a lot back. It's a mindset. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah. Pr mo most people gain weight back. They may not all gain all of it back, but it's very common. So again, I, I think, you know, you have to understand that all this stuff's money, right? Ozempic medications, bariatric surgeries. There's a lot of money. It's a huge, huge industry, billion dollar industries. And so there's a lot of marketing going on behind there to influence how you think about it. So a lot of people intuitively think, oh, bas give bariatric surgery, cut the stomach down. Of course, you're going to lose weight. No, of course, you're not because you will. Everyone loses weight initially. But then again, if you don't change your mindset, you're going to end up bringing the calories up because again, folks, the eating is not the problem. The, the, your emotional eating is a symptom of a deeper problem. And again, it can't be any more clear than when people that do bariatric surgery, they put the weight back on. You know? um, Bella says, my problem is self-sabotage. Um, Bella, your, your problem is not self-sabotage. Your problem is that you do not have the strategies, the mindset, uh, to think and, and live as a thin, healthy person. If you did, you wouldn't sabotage yourself. You know, I say this all the time. No one's you, you're, you're, you think it's self-sabotage because you think the solution is to force yourself to eat a certain way. And what I'm telling you is when you have the strategies and the mindset like I love the way I eat. I love my clean days. I love eating my breakfast. I love eating my my lunch. I love eating my dinners. And then when my pleasure days come, I love eating the things I eat there. I love doing those things. I love all the lifestyle things I do. And so I love what I'm doing. There's no, how would I sabotage myself? Like I love what I'm doing. So you're confusing sabotage with not knowing. You don't know. You don't have eating strategies that comfortably allow you to eat in a way that keeps you at your goal weight. Unless, tell me, unless you do, <laughs> if you have, if you have strategies to eat that keep you at your goal weight that you love following and enjoy and, and make your quality of life better, but you're not doing them, then you let me know that. Then that would be sabotage and I'll take it back. But I, I already know you do not have those strategies. None of you do if you're dieters. You have, you're, you're, you think I need to fight against myself and force myself to eat a certain way. 
And if you don't do that, then you're sabotaging yourself. And I think that's bullshit. Again, it's like, it would be like saying, um, sabotage would be like, you started, you went out today and went and did some heroin. But you don't want to do heroin though. You would have to force yourself to do it. You would never do that because you don't want to do it. You know, it's sabotaging yourself is going out and spending all your money at the, at the mall. You're not doing that. Right? So, so again, I don't think it's sabotage. I think it's a lack of strategy. Maybe I'm wrong. Science said I weighed 10 and a half pounds when I was born. <laughs> Menopause, excellent talk. Okay. Uh, Jim turned off my diet brain and I'm now at a healthy weight and stress-free. That's right. Don's a killer. She's doing great. Alcohol is a hell of a drug. Absolutely, Juke Jester. And I say this all the time. Alcohol to me gets a... Yeah, there, there's a great example of, of marketing, okay? Because in my world, alcohol is the most dangerous drug on the planet. Again, we get a lot of focus on heroin and cocaine. But I mean, I, the most close to death I've ever been is when I've been shit-faced. Alcohol, without question, has been the four closest times in my life that I almost killed myself, literally. Um, and so I think... Alcohol to me is has been without question the most dangerous drug. And it's it's weird. We just minimize it, you know. Um, Deb says, I made it to your live. Speaking of sustainable moderation, what do you use for salad dressing? Um, the salad dressing I use is whoops. Uh salad dressing I use, I, I use different ones. Again, don't don't obsess with the salad dressing. Cause you know, as they say, like a, a teaspoon of medicine, a, a teaspoon of sugar makes the medicine go down. So if you're eating a giant nutrient dense nutrient variety salad um and you're putting some dressing on it i i wouldn't worry so much about that at least initially um but what i usually i usually have like a like a greek dressing that's homemade here uh sometimes i what am i using now this is a more national brand it, it's is it ken's i think it's ken's but it's like it's their simply vinaigrette I, they might be ken simply vinaigrette greek i've been i've been using that um sometimes i use like annie's uh and he's got a dressing, you know, sometimes. So, so again, I, I use, and again, I don't use a ton of it, but, but I, I think dressing again, th there's no problem. The dressing's not the problem in this scheme of things. Typically, but I'm glad you made it here, Deb. Um, you look like your lifestyle. Thank you. Um, for sure. Less is better. Natural evolution. I like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, about to spend two weeks visiting parents. Dad is huge trigger because he's critical of my weight. Yeah. And thinks he knows best how I should go about losing it. Any tips? Yeah, for sure, Erica. Um, Erica, you know what I'll do for you? Um, you're in the program, right, Erica? I know you are. You're in the program, right? Did you just get back and you wanted me to set it? Are you Erica W? Okay. Are you? You wrote to me. You wrote to me today to restart you. Is that is that you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm going to do for you, Erica? I'm going to give you, when this calls over, I can write myself a note. Cause I, like I said, I literally, as soon as I turn this thing off, I forget everything. Um, okay. okay. I'm going to give you a week of coaching. Okay. So I'm going to give you next week. I'm going to give you I hope you'll be able to make these, but whatever. But I'm going to give you a week access to the coaching calls, okay? And, and we'll talk about this, all right? Because this is a, an in-depth one. Well, you'll learn a lot from the conversation, and I'll give you some strategies to deal with it um, if you can make it. You know, if you can't make it, um, the simple thing is I would listen to the hypnosis sessions so that you're extra calm and relaxed, focused, and motivated. I would use the rehearsal technique so that you, right now, you're already programming yourself. I can see because you're anticipating that he's going to trigger you because you're replaying all the last conversations in the past and how they, how you've responded to them. So remember that the main part of the rehearsal technique is that you're starting to create new associations that of how you want to respond and how you want to act. He's going to keep saying the same shit. So you can't change him. We'll let that go. What I want you to put all your energy on is how you want to respond to it. Okay. And that's the big question I'm going to leave you with here. And then let's talk about on the coaching call is, how do you want to respond to what he says? So in my mind, I, I would, well, and, and we'll talk more in depth about this, but even over the weekend, I would go back in time to some especially triggering conversations and replay them in your mind the way you would like them to have gone ideally. So imagine yourself being relaxed, calm, centered, focused, motivated, and respond that way. Now you're just imagining it, but that starts to open the door and create new neural associations and connections 
that will allow you to actually respond that way. And that's what we will talk about on the coaching call. But so start thinking about how you want to respond to it. He's going to keep saying the same thing. So in the past, it's always been like, I wish you would stop saying those things. But what you're doing is you're giving your power away when you do that. Okay. He's going to continue to say the same things and you're going to welcome it because it's going to give you the opportunity to sit there and relax and respond with the way you want to. The way you respond to things like that is <sighs> sure. Yep. Okay. Great. <laughs> you know, and if that's how you want to respond, again, there's a lot of responses we can have, but um, I think feeling indifferent, let him say whatever he says. Uh, I'll give you this one too. You can imagine there's a force field around you and any stupid shit words hit the force field and fall to the ground and don't get into you. Okay. Because you're in control of your mindset. Let him say whatever he wants. How you respond to it is up to you. And that's a much more empowering thought. So let him keep saying the things he's going to say, but you focus on what you can control, which is your responses to it. All right. And let's talk about the next week. So that'll be really valuable for you because you'll be right in the situation. And I promise you, we will come up with some insights and some strategies that will help you deal with that. Okay. So I will, um, uh, as soon as I get off here, I'm going to reset you and I will set you up for a week of, of coaching. And so you'll get those emails. You'll get the email Tuesday and Thursday are the calls Tuesdays, 6 PM at night Eastern and uh, Thursday is 3 PM Eastern. Okay. And you'll get access to those calls the morning of Tuesday and the morning of Thursday. I'll send you a link to those. All right. And um, it'll be cool to meet anyways, but that'll help you. All right. Cool. All right, everyone. Super. It's been a great call. You guys are awesome. And um, I appreciate it. Oh, Lozy Johnson. Oh, nice listening to you here. Where do you usually listen? You listen on TikTok? Some people say listen on Instagram. It sounds better because I'm using the, the big old, uh, you know, this microphone. They said this is what Michael Jackson recorded Thriller with. I don't know if that's still a flex anymore because people hate Michael Jackson, but he's a good singer. But uh, yeah, this microphone does sound better. So if you listen on uh, on Instagram or YouTube, it usually sounds better, but then um, it's easier with TikTok. I hope they don't get rid of TikTok. <laughs> Are they still doing that? I don't know. I haven't heard anything, but I hope they don't because I, I love I love all the people. Um, oh, that's right. What's up, John? Yeah, yeah. Have a good weekend. John, you still a Sox fan? What do you like? The, the Rangers now? <laughs> the Astros, right? Yeah. Um, well, you said you're funny too. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, go socks, right? Well, that's is it opening day? I think it is, right? It's opening day coming up. Okay, still like the socks. All right. So still got still got your 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 New England roots, right? You don't lose that. Hard to shift teams, right? Because you're loyal. Loyal. And you shift teams. <laughs> All right, everyone. Super duper. Have a, a great weekend and we'll talk soon. Bye.